love of God that is Calvary Episcopal Church here in Lombard, Illinois. Our church wardens, Jennifer Hendrich and Jim Philkins, and all the members of our vestry join me in thanking you for choosing to worship God here at Calvary on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost as we continue to observe the pandemic-related protocols, may I respectfully remind you that the choir will sing the people's portions of the service that are to be sung, and you're welcome to sing those portions silently in your heart. Thank you once again for being here at Calvary. Thank you once again for witnessing to the power of God's love. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us glorify God as we say together, Glory to God in the highest, and in Jesus' name on earth. Glory to God, heavenly King, Almighty God in the We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your word. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. We are not seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For we alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. My Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God. The Lord be with you. Isaiah chapter 35, beginning at the fourth verse. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
And let's read together Psalm 146, found in your bulletin on page four. Together, Alleluia. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, for whose help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who gives, who gives justice to those who are oppressed, and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are by down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the poor and widow, but frustrates the way. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. The second reading is from the second chapter of James. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes down into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While the one who is poor, you say, stand there and sit at my feet. I have, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has God not chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppose you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You will you do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over justice. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, Keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. <laughs> Jesus set out and went away into the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre, and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaha, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. <laughs> the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Jesus The Jesus we meet in this morning's gospel is not the Christ of so many sweet imaginations. Just as many artists presented our Lord as blonde and blue-eyed, which could not be an accurate depiction of someone born so near the equator, but was long successful in associating God with people of European descent, just as many artists presented our Lord as blonde and blue-eyed, the Jesus that so many think of is an unfailingly polite, always kind, milk toast of a man. 
The Jesus that Mark shares with us this morning is more truthful than tender, more controlling than compassionate, and more dismissive than delightful. He speaks with a harshness that must have hurt. We know little of the Gentile woman who asked Jesus to cure her daughter. It seems clear that she loved the child and that she believed that Jesus could cure her. When the Lord replies to the woman's request by saying, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, one almost imagines his mother rushing in and saying that Christ must go to bed without supper for being so rude. <laughs> Jesus as much as suggests that the woman and her daughter are dogs. And just as the nativity scene that we see each Christmas fails to convey the odor of wet straw and the stench of animal waste, the ideas that many have of Jesus lack the ferocity of his commitment to doing God's will and the singular focus that lived in him and with which he lived. Perhaps we would do well to consider the Syrophoenician woman. She could have stormed off in a huff in response to our Lord's initial dismissal. She could have spoken sharply to Jesus or otherwise insulted him. But her response reveals she too was focused. Her primary concern was the well-being of her daughter and not how she felt about the way she had been spoken to. Her primary concern was the well-being of her daughter and not how she felt about the way she had been spoken to. If we understand that hurt people hurt people, if we understand that people who are hurt go on and hurt others, if we understand that hurt people hurt people, perhaps we can see that when others act in ways that are painful or rude, their behavior is a statement about who they are and not about what we deserve. And as we are sometimes the recipients of hostile or unkind remarks, it is hard to not take it personally. But the truth is, we are to some people only what they have decided we are. President Obama writes about the time that he was a state senator and attended a party. Another party guest walked up to him and told Mr. Obama what the guest wanted to drink because to that person, a black man at such a party must have been the help. The great Maya Angelou once said, when people show you who they are, believe them. <laughs> It seems this sage advice has gone unheeded, at least as it applies to the Prince of Peace. Jesus isn't some smiling, swell guy who wouldn't hurt a fly. Jesus calls for a revolution in the human experience, insisting that love, not money or power, is what is most important. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, that anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, verse 43, 
that if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Jesus is not asking that we turn our backs on our loved ones, but that we place a very special priority on our relationship with him. Jesus is not encouraging the faithful to maim themselves, but he is insisting that we separate ourselves from all that separates us from God. When Jesus asks us to take up our cross and follow him, he is saying that we must choose to be loving in the face of distress. We must go on being patient when we are weary of waiting. We must decide to forgive even when the injury is great. And this is precisely the time when we do well to be reminded of how important it is to keep our minds on Jesus. The aftermath of our nation's longest war has not only seen the revisiting of the sadness known to the many who have lost loved ones, with some lost just recently, but also a consideration of the many who have been injured, the many who experience post-traumatic stress disorder, the many who have lost a limb, the 18 veterans of our armed services who, having lost hope, are ending their lives every day. And this, while states of emergency have been declared in New York and New Jersey given the once in 500 year storm they recently experienced, immobilizing many communities and immersing a great many in great sadness. And this, while some people in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast are trapped in flooded homes in 100 degree heat without power, without cell phone access, and without clean water to drink. And I have not yet today mentioned the fires in the West that have charred hundreds of thousands of acres and If this is not the time to turn to Jesus and to renew our faith in him, if these were not the days to be grateful for all of the problems that we do not have, if it were helpful to recall that God is not Santa Claus, and we do not crawl up on his lap with a list of things we want, but instead affirm that ours is a God who empowers us not to avoid tragedy, but to overcome it. God did not spare Jesus what it was to witness the death of a loved one. Jesus knew what it was to be laughed at and left out and left behind. Our Lord experienced great heat and great cold, and about him things were told that were hurtful and cruel. And yet, he stayed focused on what it was he thought God wanted him to do. If those who believe in Jesus are not those who can be relied upon to pray, to share what we have, if those who believe in Jesus are not those who continue to see and to be goodness, on whom shall our Lord and God's world rely? Yes, it would be better 
if our nation did not leave even a single Afghan citizen who supported our troops and their mission to the mercy of the Taliban. Yes, we would like it if not a single American were left in a hostile foreign land. Yes, many would know more joy if more people accepted the science and were vaccinated. And we need not fear another round of school closings and the imposition of pandemic-related protocols. But shall we only trust God when fires do not burn and when rivers do not overflow? Shall he only be our God when we get what we want and things go as we prefer? If Jesus knew anguish in his earthly experience, how arrogant are we tempted to be in thinking that we should be spared anguish? Shall we only hear Jesus when he asks what we are comfortable hearing, when he demands no more than we are willing to give? The faith lives today because those who came before us believed in God, even when they lived in chains, even when they knew the pains of war and waywardness and want. Our Christian ancestors faced lions and lies, and throughout all of the times that have gone by, the people of God have known hard times and hardship, but they went on being loving. They went on serving. They went on doing the best they could because they knew that even the smallest good was a light that drove away darkness. Jesus gave the Syrophoenician woman the opportunity to lose herself in her feelings, to lose herself in her fears, or in being close to Jesus, draw even more near. And that is our choice too. Jesus gave the Syrophoenician woman the opportunity to become preoccupied with all that was wrong, with that which was not right, but instead she focused on Jesus being the light. And that is our choice too. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.
all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the peace of the world, the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the church in every place, for all assemblies of faith, and for the well-being of all people, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For Joseph, our president, for Kamala, our vice president, for JB, our governor, Keith, our village president, and for all others in authority, that they may do justice, love, kindness, and walk humbly with God. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Jeff, our retired bishop, Paula, our bishop-elect, Chilton, our assisting bishop-designate, Alonzo, our priest, Jennifer and Jim, our church wardens, Jan, Jerry, Joe, Drew, Lisa, and Marilyn, our vestry, for all members of Calvary Church, for those who visit and worship with us, and for all those who serve and lead the church. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For our good earth that God has given us, for the wisdom and the will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the persecuted, the unemployed, and the underemployed, for all immigrants and refugees, for all prisoners and captives, for all those who are trafficked, and for all in any trouble, for the unloved and the unwelcome. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, for the aged and the sick, for the addicted, for those who are alone, for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially remembering Trinita, Courtney, Jan, Jim, Gloria, Bruce, Harrison, Tom, and those whose names we offer, offer in spoken or in silent prayer. Lord, as we thank you for all of your gifts bestowed upon humankind, we thank you this Labor Day weekend for the blessing of work and for all of the labors which add so much to the human experience. We thank you, Lord, for unions and for management, for laws which regulate the amount of time people may work and the conditions under which they work. We thank you, Lord, for all those who make it possible for others to be employed and to know the dignity of providing for their well-being and the well-being of those they love. And we ask that as this weekend continues, those upon whose labor we rely might be mindful of our respect and affection. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we ask the blessing upon the clergy and people of the Episcopal Church of Sudan. And our diocesan cycle of prayer, we've been asked to pray, and so we do, Father, for the general convention of the Episcopal Church, particularly the House of Bishops, the House of Clerical and Lay Deputies, and the Executive Council, which is the vestry of the National Church between the general convention meetings. I ask the Lord that you might grace their work in ways that enable them to fulfill your purpose. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For all young people, for all in military service, especially Alyssa Elliott, Edgar Arlano, Eric M. Casper, and Michael Jenkerick. For all whose labors add much to our common life, and for those whose needs are known to God alone, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to domestic, gender, and all forms of violence, for an end to injustice, bigotry, and oppression, 
Let's pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For all the faithful departed, especially for all our deceased family and friends, for the departed clergy and members of Calvary Church, for those who died alone, and those whose deaths are largely <laughs> unknown. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Those who choose to are welcome to. Please turn to page 833 in the Book of Common Prayer, that we might together offer the concluding call. Those who choose to are welcome and invited to please turn to page 833 in the Book of Common Prayer, that there we might offer together a prayer attributed to St. Francis, a prayer we offer at this morning's concluding call of the prayer to the people. Together we pray, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Our service continues with the confession of sin. The confession of sin can be found on page 11 in your service bulletins. Let us confess our sins against God, our neighbors, and ourselves. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned. Everybody. Good morning. It's so nice to see new faces and more faces as I haven't been facing you for a while. We need to make sure that mic is turned up and that it's not like All right, well, it's a good thing I'm a singer. I got a big voice. So anyway, I am the director of music, Sabina, 
And again, it's nice to see new faces um, since I've been up there for many months. And now uh, the past couple months we've had a limited choir, which has been wonderful. Um, we are masked up there. We are small and mighty, and we've loved every minute of making music during service. And with that in mind, I am excited to announce that official choir rehearsals will resume next Sunday, September 12th. So, if you are someone who has been in the choir, who is eagerly awaiting for the fall choir season, or who would like to become a new choir member, please contact me. At 10.30 a.m. next Sunday, the 12th, we will meet after service from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. Weather permitting, we'll begin by gathering together outside in front of the church for a few moments of mask-free discussion. <coughs> in the locked, masking is still required, so we will be discussing how that's all going to work. Things are going to continue to progress and perhaps go a few steps back. So we're gonna have, just open the discussion uh, with what's been a reality in our lives for, for many months now. Um, and the most exciting part to me is we're actually gonna sing, we're gonna rehearse things. We're gonna start looking at anthems. We're going to talk about the hymns that we'll be doing the next several weeks and in the season to come. We're gonna have a vision for this year's choir. And I'm so excited after being here for nearly a year that we have reached this point. So if you have any questions, please contact me. And I uh, hopefully will see some more people next week after church for choir. Thank you. Just a very quick reminder, a week from Saturday, September 18th, we're going to have our fall cleanup. It's going to run from about 8 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. If you can't come for the full five hours, but you can come uh, for, for some period of time, that's great. Uh, what we do will kind of depend on the weather and how many people we have. So the more of you who can come and help out, the more things we, we can get done. Once again, Saturday, September 18th from 8 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Marilyn Stein. Um, to talk about formation for a moment, uh, I had hoped to have the books for you today. Anyone who's interested in the class will be starting, but they did not arrive yet. Uh, so we're going to have to push that back a little bit. Um, hopefully by next week, the books will begin. Um, most people have said that they would like the class to unfortunately be the same time at, as the choir, because uh, that is the most convenient time, but I think um, that'll work out because many of the people who want to be in the class are not in the choir. So I think that's gonna be okay. Um, so next week, hopefully those books will be here so we can begin the class. And also um, the Lectio Divina booklets will be here uh, for you to take home with you, as well as being printed in the e-news um, for the, the coming week. Um, one other thing I'd just like to remind you is when we come up for communion, when we are along the altar rail, please keep six feet between you and the next person, unless that's the person's your spouse or what have you. But um, we, we want to be safe, so we're gonna do it slowly with six feet in between in the line and six feet in between along the altar rail. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, God being good, Father Alonzo has agreed to stay with us until the end of December. So, <laughs> that's it. I'm just going to try to see if I can fix this mic. <laughs> Right. 
and creatures. They operated upon, I understand, thanks to our beloved sister Ada, that again, today we transfer, tomorrow we transfer to a further rehabilitation facility. Uh, she was one of the members of the guild and perhaps will continue to be in the days ahead, but for now, um, it would be inappropriate for us to expect her to carry out that ministry. <clears throat> Even if you're only willing to call five people or four people a month, that is, one person a week. If you'd be willing to make one telephone call on behalf of Calvary Church a week, I would ask you to please consider meeting with the guild when we announce our next meeting with those people. Be this month, probably near the end of the month, so that we can assemble this effort around making certain that all of the people who are members of Calvary Church know themselves to be cherished and treasured. We want primarily to share information and to remind the faithful here of how important it is to be the faithful here. We're not asking you to join the guild so you can ask people for money. We certainly don't want you to call people to make them feel guilty if they haven't been in church. We want to express a concern for all of our members that cannot be expressed without members of the church reaching out. And to some extent, there are some people who will tell you that the clergy reaching out is wholly insufficient because as the old priest told me, we are paid to be good. <laughs> to that extent, I hope that at least a couple of you will consider being part of our All Saints Pastoral Care Guild. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and a sweet sacrifice to God. suffering and want. 
whether the suffering is caused by external realities like earthquakes and floods and fires, whether the suffering is caused by realities which affect the spirit like hostility and cruelty and neglect. We ask that you would comfort all those who know this great earth. We pray for our nation in this time of trial. We pray for all the nations of the earth that increasingly peace must reign. And we thank you, Lord, for being a God who forgives sin and empowers goodness. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This 
this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink, do this for the remembrance of me. According to his command, O oh Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming for glory. And we offer our sacrifice, praise and thanksgiving to you, O oh Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, O oh gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. That they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice. That we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where. With the ever blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Joseph, the work of blessed Francis of Assisi, the blessed saints of Calvary, who watched Jesus die and did whom Jesus lived. And all oh, your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author our salvation. <clears throat> By him and with him and in him in thy love the Holy Spirit on and is yours O mighty Father now and forever. Amen. <laughs> the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, When you pray, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. For you and the way you live your life. For the burdens you bear, these two are the gifts of God.
our post-communion prayer can be found on page 16 in our service book. <clears throat> Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and loving God, you have drawn us to your heart and nourished us at your table with holy food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and your more. Amen. For all those present this morning who are celebrating birthdays and the week to come or days to come, please come forward at this time. satisfaction in all the glory of God. We thank you, Father, for giving us these extraordinary men to love, to learn from, and to lead with. And we are grateful that the angels and saints whose prayers always defend us join us in celebrating the anniversaries of their births. My brother, the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you in the name of Jesus this day, these birthdays, and all things. Amen. Amen. Now, would you please turn and face the church? Let's give them a birthday. <laughs> and now, mindful that there are some celebrating birthdays and wedding anniversaries. For not physically present, but as often the prayer also found on page 16. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, in the servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace, and strengthen their trust in your hands, Lord, all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Beloved of God, the psalmist wrote centuries and centuries ago that our help comes from the Lord. Be mindful of that in whatever situation you find yourself, in whatever need you take to God that your help is in the Lord. And sometimes, God asks us to be that help in the lives of others for whom Christ died. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and all those who love and serve this 15th Sunday after Pentecost, and always, Amen. Amen. Before I pronounce upon the blessing, let me just mention one thing. Other thing, um, I will not be with you next Sunday because uh, Mike and I are going to Maine for a long plan trip. But Father Clayton Thomason will again be with you. And the only other Sunday that I won't be here between now and the end of the year is um, Sunday, October 31st. Uh, before Jennifer had talked to me and Richard would give me the opportunity to be with you for the rest of the year, I had promised Father.
a mass in Burke that I would celebrate the Trinity Church with him. But other than those two Sundays, I, I was going to say I'd have to miss another Sunday because my grandmother was spending the night here. But my wife pointed out that he can spend the night on Friday. Yeah, that's funny. So um, that's why it's good to have not just one brain thinking because you know, sometimes they all wear it up and up and up. So I, I won't be here next Sunday, and I won't be here the last Sunday in October, but I expect to be with you. God willing, not being kind to the rest of you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.